I grew up on a native reserve. We were locked away on government settlements, missions and reserves. Degrading, dehumanizing conditions. Went to the mission settlement. We were fed boiled sheep and porridge with weevils and stolen wages. As I look back to the life, my mother and father suffered. They had hard lives. Dad was born in 1902 mm. on the reserve at Wellaby. Mum was born up on the Gladio country, Goldfields, in 19, 1907. And she was taken away from her mother and made to walk behind a horse and dray 15 miles to this town with a railhead and branded niggers for more of his native settlements. Dad used to sit down and tell me the racism. He can't run away from the job to chase him down with dogs and everything in a swamp. Like the Deep South, we had a right here. We had to be out of town at 6 o'clock, 6 p.m. Otherwise we were at this jail. Dad used to say to mum in the language, when he, he couldn't tell the time, he couldn't read and write. He couldn't tell the time, but he knew where the sun was in the summer. Mm. In the winter, he knew which bird was going to shout, tell him what time it is. He went through that animal through clock as part of our culture, you know, mm. spirituality. And he was saying the language to mum, Queen, her name was Queenie. Queen, Kulunga Barman, and the man had Kumbania. Police will get us, lock us all up. We had to race the horse and cart. Growing up, Dad had a government job and being Aboriginal people, we had to live in the, where the sheep and the pigsty was. And yet, Dad was raking out the old steam engines on the line, even though he had a job. And a white fella got the same job. The white fella got the house. We had to go and live on the, in the pigsty. Mm. You know, trucking yard where they put sheep, pigs. And we had a camp there. Can't have a shower, can't have a bath much. Pretty hard growing up. Kids called us nigger and everything. Then they took us away to the mission. And that was all, oh, that was all, oh, that was a Christian people fed us like dogs. I ran away from there, never got paid the proper work, never got paid work for nothing. Stolen wages, we got plenty. Yeah, we was in jail a lot. Mm. Just because mum and dad had no food. We'd go and steal a sheep. We should have been, we should have been able to get, get some ration, but we couldn't. What ration we did get was very small. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we're stealing food all the time. We had to. Mm -hmm. We'd go to three mile, three mile to jail for receiving a bottle of wine. I'd, bought a bottle of wine, they jailed me again. It was just, you know, it was a crime to be an Aboriginal. You're living in a place where there's no work, you learn how to steal and you learn how to fight mm. to survive. Mm. Life was hard. And they'd come around with spotlights on the reservation you were outside, your eyes were shining in the spotlight, just like a kangaroo down and down. And you know, my dad, he, he had to smile on the back of a horse and cart when 1920, when some royalty came over here from England. They said, look, if you don't smile to the camera and hold your hands with your people, and, uh, we cut off your rations and you go to jail.
Dad was smiling there, but he was heavy. His heart was heavy. He was sadness. Racism is alive for wealth. As a man who's touching 80, I've, I've experienced racism for the last 70 years. I know there's a lot of good non-Aboriginal people support us, but there are lots out there and, you know, they're very racist. But yeah, when I look today and see all this, what happened to that dear man, George Floyd, in America, to see him get murdered by them other police, mm. right all over the world. You now the cameras are rolling everywhere. You know, you get, and it brought me back memories. I've been to protests for the last 70 years. I've climbed up, I've walked up to Parliament House carrying coffins with other Aboriginal people mm. because of the deaths. 400 people since the deaths, since the Royal Commission. And it's still going on. Mm. They're still dying. Every year we have a John Pat Memorial, a young Aboriginal man killed, murdered by police in Roman jail. Five white policemen walk free, kicked him to death. because I knew they were going to get out. They'll get out of every one of them. They always do. What's going on? Why are these people dying in, in, in the care of prison department, police? Why are they dying like this and nothing is done? Committing suicide. It's, it breaks the heart because we got nowhere. Reconciliation they've been talking for the last hundred years about <laughs> ever since colonization. And you know, Captain Cook wrote in his diary one sensible thing he said when he wrote back to England. He said, When I see these people, he said, they are so happy here living on this land. They get their food like a supermarket and there they sleep out in the open and like a king sleeping in a palace in England on a bed of downs. They have everything. And that was the end of the dream time when he came. It was 300 years of nightmare then. They were stopped massacres and everything. Now, I heard, took this down, I heard something this morning. They're going to pull down statues. Said, you don't, don't take them down, leave it there as a reminder. All right, leave it there as a reminder, but put all the, put them on the placard what we would have put. They were part of the massacres here. They murdered Aboriginal people, men and women. So don't worry, no, they're not as good as you think they are. Leave the statue there, but put all that writing there. We lose. It makes us, we lose our heart. What's in that ground is sacred to us. I know our places where kids was baptized, birthing places, sacred dances, initiation places, all part of something like you see in a cathedral down here. Mm. They worship that place. But yeah, the land is very sacred to us. I like going back on country, heading back. I've been to Alice Springs, stayed up there, sit down with the Aranda people. I met the late and great Albert Nemanjera, the painter. That was his family who gave me that. Mm. They are just up there. But he is a man who suffered under the white man's law. He made plenty of money, he was a great painter. He's got paintings hanging up in Buckingham Palace. Wow. I met him in Perth, oh, he's a big man he was. Yeah. In 1956, he came to Perth. We were still being driven out of town at six o'clock. But we met him. He met a special place. Uh, he died he died in jail. He came out, he finished it with pneumonia. Alcohol killed him. 
his spirit was gone. The spirit is very close to us. Oh, our spirit is always there. Feel it when I go. I've always, always thought, you know, one day it's going to be a change. Mm. Now it's happening now. Mm. I'm in a unit now. Mm. I'm not on a reservation anymore. I can see all around. I got white neighbours around here, another couple, Aboriginal lady down there, old lady, it's all seniors here. Mm -hmm. I'm hoping that we're going to get that to go ahead with a treaty. And we want our, 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 our um, policies to be enshrined in the parliament where we can make a decision on our, what and my people want. We understand, we identify. We don't want a white fellow telling my people what to do, locking them up, building more jails. They've got to hand it over to us. We want to build communities where we can give our own group therapy because we know how to do it, we identify. Mm -hmm. We know what goes through the head. We know what's causing a lot of their problems. It goes right back to their grandfathers and great-grandfathers who were brutally stolen and locked up in government settlements. Mm -hmm. And we've got to break them out of that cycle. They're on a merry-go-round. Well, I'd like to say that my people and the non-Aboriginal people, listen to us. We want to walk with you. We've had a hard life. White Australia got a black history. I've suffered. I've been there. My father's been there. Listen to us. We want to tell you. We want to. We want to know. We want you to know our feelings. And sit down and talk with you. We don't hate you. I can forgive, but I can never forget what happened to me and my father and my mother. How they was driven off their sacred land and uh, suffered at the hands of the colonizers. But if the racism has run deep into the family, I know that they will never break that cycle. Mm. Their kids will grow up with racism. They will too. It's in there. Bingley and I, this lady here, I was giving a talk in a middle-class Anglican girl school, middle-class, well off. A young girl got up 14 years of age. She said, Uncle Ben, Bingley, why do I see Aboriginal people very angry at the shopping centre, young men, getting handcuffed on TV, stolen cars, laying drunk in parks? Bingley said, thank you, my dear, you've got a lot of nerve to stand up and say that. The reason why they're doing this, they've, they've got hopelessness, racism, drugs, alcohol, violent environment where they live, a racism by police and people, and they know no way out. They drink or drug to kill the pain. No one want to listen. And, and, she said, thank you, Uncle Ben Mingley. When I get to the dinner table tonight, I'm going to tell Mum and Dad, when you, when you use the word nigger and say they're lazy, sit down and talk with an elder like Uncle Ben and Mingley. They'll tell you the true history, why these kids are so angry. They, they bear the scars of their grandfathers and their mothers and fathers who've been taken away and soul destroyed with racism and the massacres, the frontier wars that happened in Australia. I know all about them. I've travelled all around from here to Tasmania, Queensland, New South Wales, South Australia. And the frontier wars has done a lot of damage. You know, Pinjara massacre down there, Ombulgari up in, 
up at Wyndham, Forest River Mission where they were slaughtered there. And it goes on and on. No, they want to worship Anzac Day. When we talk about frontier wars, they reckon it never happened. It happened. History is there. It's in our heads, us elders. We were passed down. Our elders couldn't read and write, but they passed it around the campfire. What happened? They, they lost all hope, hopelessness. Because I want Aboriginal people to know that we have a voice. We must come together. It's all in you. It's all in your corner now. It's in your court. You've heard us elders say what sort of hard life we had. We grew up when everything was coming into place. We had apartheid laws, but now you guys have got you got everything. I want you all to get a good education, so I can see you working in the bank, working in hospitality, working in supermarkets and everywhere because the time now has come to pay the rent because we, we've had enough. I want to see my people walk strong. Yuri Arvin, stand tall. Listen to your elders. Support each other. Don't fight amongst each other. And to all my Aboriginal people out there, We've got to stand together. We can't be arguing amongst each other, being jealous of each other. We're all black fellows. We're Noongas, whether we Noonga, Yamaji, Wangai, Hinjaburni. We're all Aboriginal people fighting for one thing, fighting to survive. As Martin Luther King said, he wanted his kids to grow up not to be rac racially vilified by the colour of their skin, but by the, what did that word he said? By the contents. Oh, the content is off. Yeah. For non Aboriginal people, multicultural, African Americans, we've got African Americans coming now to our, to our, um, all our rallies and everything, protests. They know how they're treated over that way now, we're treated here. To stand with us, all you people, Christian, non-Christian people, Aboriginal, non-Aboriginal people, we love you. We want you to sit down and talk with us and walk with us to know our feelings. We don't want to be enemies to you. I wake up and I thank the spirits every morning that I'm sober. I've got no, nothing to do with any addiction. I don't drink or smoke. I drive a car. I'm going around and talk to my people. I'm, a, I'm on the Deaths and Custody Committee. I'm going to go there. I'm on. Uh, I'm an advisor to the City of Perth Council and with Aboriginal people. And I'm in, in, I'm in need all the time. And that gives me strength and it gives me hope. As they said on placards, justice, what they say, justice, then peace. Because they're going to get justice, then we'll have peace. Until we get that, we won't have peace. We'll keep on fighting. As I said, I'm at the end of my road, end of the road, and I'll go to the last. I'll die carrying that Noongar flag. <laughs>